child growing up back in the States, I had a wonderful Christian upbringing. My mother, my, well, my father to some extent, my siblings, my neighborhood. We were all from a pretty homogenous Christian upbringing. As time grew on, our family all independently had a breaking point from the church. It wasn't like we stopped believing in, in God or in Christianity even for that part. But we felt that something about the organized church didn't fit any of us. So that was when I went off in more of an exploratory mission of my own. And at that point I started searching about different religions, including Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I stayed to, as it would seem, as the Ahl al-Kitab, without even knowing it. I didn't look in much beyond that. I was somewhat intrigued by going to North Africa, and I was offered a position in Tunisia. The community in the, the West wasn't exactly, it wasn't easy for me to make that transition. Many of them said things about Africa or about very tribal regions and Arabs and I didn't listen. I came anyways and alhamdulillah I found people in Tunisia who maybe not, uh, they didn't really tell me everything about Islam. It wasn't a place that a foreigner comes and learns about the religion too much. But I did find people there who were so kind, and they would show me the, the sincere generosity that I only found in this part of the world. Not saying it doesn't happen everywhere, but for some reason Tunisians really, they really demonstrated to me that there's something deep in their culture, something very, very, very well established that was central to all the people. <laughs> Through that experience, I first heard the Adhan. I lived in a Muslim country where people were practicing and saw a lot of the, again, the, the shared sort of uh, Islamic values that would work their way into the culture and the customs of the nation. And I remember the funny story, the first time I heard the Adhan, we were walking on the streets and all of a sudden the speaker comes out and says, Allahu Akbar, and I said in French, qui chante? In other words, who's singing? I didn't know this was an Islamic thing, I thought this was just somebody singing over a speaker, because everything I heard in Tunisia was music and cars with music and everyone singing there, so it kind of uh, threw me off guard. When I was in the university, I studied a bit of Islam, and I felt that Islam was something a bit uh, pure, but different. So I never had any bad thoughts of the religion or the people, but I felt it was way too different for me. It would have been maybe looked down upon by my community, it would have been a huge lifestyle change, it was much more strict than the loose style I was used to. So I learned a lot about the religion in the university, and I had interaction with Muslims in the university and then also in Tunisia, in Dubai, in Bahrain, Oman, all over the Gulf as well. But nothing really caught my attention until I read a book by a man from Iowa, is a state in, Mich uh, state in the US, Iowa. He was living in the UK I believe and wrote a book called A Brief History of Nearly Everything. So it was a scientific book that mapped out basically what we know. And after I look at it, I'd say, wow, it's amazing what we know. SubhanAllah, people really know a lot of information. And then at the end of the section, he'd always say, but this is less than 5% of what's actually out there. So I kept reading this, it's a huge book. It's something like, I don't know, 800 pages or something. It goes through the whole history of the world. And it hits on every topic that's, uh, that you could say was created by God, or one could say is what science is trying to figure out what it actually means. And I, I just kept coming to the same point. God has to have done everything for us because we can't even replicate or learn what He's given us in a clear way. We can, there was one part in the book that caught me. He said, we can go to the Amazon in South America and shake a random tree. And the act of shaking that random tree hard enough, something will fall out of that tree that we've never heard of before, we've never documented before in human existence. It's that easy. I had friends, uh, mostly living here in Dubai and in the Gulf. Like I said, I lived between Dubai, um, Bahrain, Oman, Tunis, with a lot of visits to Egypt and other countries in the region. And 
I just asked all of them questions um, to the point where people would tell me, stop asking questions because you're just going to stop yourself from making the next move in your life. If you're asking, like, why do women have to cover in a certain exact way, it's a negative question about the religion. Instead of saying, why don't women cover in this way, or why is it natural that women look at this way, look at the whole picture of everything in life. Don't just ask the, the questions that are weird about Islam and keep questioning that over and over again. And so I, I started learning a little bit more on my own at that point. I realized that me asking everybody else would only give me an impression of what they know and what they might see as beneficial for me. But religion isn't about you and everybody else only. It's about you and your own search through your heart to find what really means something and what's going to better your life. As soon as I started doing that, I started almost like shaking, sweating, not in the moment, but when I would start to read in my own and start to learn in my own and start to be just alone in my room and I felt this incredible pressure. And the society never made me feel pressure. I've, I'm kind of an independent soul. I don't always feel pressure from the society. But all of a sudden I had this intense pressure. I don't know what it was. I bought a prayer rug. I was living in the, in the, in the Middle East at this point, so I had access to mosques, to information, to everything. I went and bought a prayer rug. Um, I grabbed some books from the uh, centers that would give you some English references. Went on the internet and started going to Wikipedia and everything and looking at more comparative information. And at some point I realized I'm not going to learn at all. There's no way to learn at all. You either have a moment, you take the moment, or you miss the moment. And in this moment I realized that I could die tomorrow. I could miss my chance and never have it again. In retrospect, now I know it's the dunya or the akhra, and I was looking at the dunya with so much remorse that I would miss this. The little things that I don't even care about, like drinking a beer or having a, a pork chop, the little things that are, are so meaningless consume your mind. You, you don't want to give these things up, but you feel this pressure to do something that's much, much, much more important. I, I think I dwelled on that for about a week, and then I just said, I'm not going to risk any of this for anything. I've always had so much faith. This is something new, but it's not different. It's, it's new in a way, it's reborn in a way, but it's the same as I was born with. It's nothing different at all. And I said the Shahada at that point, all by myself, in my room, cornered, <laughs> and tried praying as best as I could without really knowing anything. At that moment was when I really gave up. That was when I submitted. That was when I said, Anything in this life is meaningless because it could all end tomorrow. And unless I prepare for what's going to happen after that, my life was without any meaning. It was just me having fun, living, enjoying, and it, it wouldn't have been substantive. We're now at Safe's house. I met her when I went for Umrah. كان التقيت بي قبل حوالي سنتين كنا بالعمرة بالمدينة المنورة وشفنا هو واحدة يعني ما كويا أحد كنا يعني دائما نسأل إيش تحتاج ما تحتاج والطريق من رحنا المكة المكرمة همينا كان ويانا وصدفة همينا بال من سوينا العمرة هو هم كان ويانا كان عندك هيك ورقة بها أدعية هدانياها بين الصفاء والمروة وبعدها قعدنا وحكينا وقلت له أنا عندي ابن من عمرك وشي وإذا تحب يعني ما دام أنت بالإمارات ابني هم بالإمارات تتعرفون سوية. She didn't say like much about me. Just who are you? <laughs> من أنت؟ You're Eric. من وين؟ أمريكا. آه ما شاء الله مسلم. آه زين زين. يلا عندي ولد في الإمارات. مش ولد. <laughs> yeah, yeah. عندي ولد في الإمارات. Please you must know him and get to know him better. He's good. ما شاء الله in الدين and you can. Inshallah, learn from him a bit better. And I got the same thing. And I got the problem in the Emirates. I don't know many people who are there to teach me more and to learn more from. So, Alhamdulillah, she helped me from the very beginning. I mean, any person who sees a woman who is in a strange place, أهله مو قريبين من عنده هو مثلا صار مسلم الحمد لله والشكر بس ما دخل بالعوائل هو المفروض يتعرف عن حياة العائلة يشوف تطبيق الإسلام بالعائلة في شهر رمضان إحنا دائما في الغرفة الثانية 
صغير وكل العائلة هناك مثل مثل في البيت مش مثل في المجلس أو شيء كيف أقول وايد خاصة يعني if I'm with the family in the small room مثلا أنا واحد من العائلة مش أنا أجنبي أنا أنا ساكن هناك وبس بزير هني أحيانا لا مثل بيتي المشكلة من البداية أنا سافرت كثير وايد يعني أنا كنت في بحرين دبي عمان بلدي يعني تونس مصر أنا ما I was never in one place مكان وحيد long enough not, not long enough to actually get settled so I didn't find the brotherhood I was always missing some sort of feeling of family يعني عندي العائلة في أمريكا العائلة وايد طيبة يعني they're, they're, they're such a great family for me my family is I'll never say anything against uh, my family they've been so supportive of me all the way along but coming to have uh, an Islamic family to help support you it's very important in a new Muslim's life وفر لي مكان مريح جدا عشان تعلم اللغة العربية والشيء من الدين الإسلامي So right now we are headed to these homes that need some support. The program that we're running right now is where volunteers go out into all the Emirates and they help families in most need. We start that by getting information from them, making sure that they are actually in need, uh, finding the families from the network, the neighborhoods, the charities, and then we will basically go visit them and assess their needs in more detail. I got into this work when I was a bit younger. I used to do some versions of this in, uh, in America, helping out people in, in Detroit and different areas. But the majority of my uh, work came after that, when I came to the Middle East and Tunisia and uh, the Emirates, Bahrain and Oman. We were doing a lot of youth development work. I found this to be a better path for me personally. It was more fulfilling than the field of business or getting into things that were just for profit. So I've actually been working for a non-profit sector for the last six or so years. Um, excuse me one second. The volunteers are all here. And we will be meeting them right now and going inside the homes. Yes. Hi, Ahmed. You're here? Yes, we are coming. we're coming right in now, okay? Thank you very much. Bye. We can't all go into one small area at once. Only some of us can go into the first house. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Is your family here? My, my, my son, they were house. Your son house here, yeah. yes? And you live here also or no? Yeah, I live there. It's big house there. In this house over here. Yeah. And, uh, this is your daughter here? <laughs> they live in this room? Big room there. Big room there. And what's the problem in the house? In the house, it's about 1,500 fakat. There's a book, Omek, Inti, and Ali. It's a big one, right? It's a big one. Four people. Visa, making company, visa company. Yeah. Cool little yeah. bait, 1,500 bus. No, he's getting the giving 1,500 is getting for, for the visa. What? For the visa? Yeah. Every month 500 for the visa. Yeah. So right now we have the volunteers everywhere running around visiting the families. We're going to basically continue to spread out throughout the area and take the information from the families. If they prove that they need extra things, like a kitchen, like a, a sofa, a bed, it's part of the program that the volunteers will come and put the, the mafrushat and all of the different items in the house, assemble them, and help them, basically. وَمَا تَفْعَلُوا مِنْ خَيْرٍ يَعْلَمُوهُ اللَّهُ وَاتَّزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَى وَاتَّقُونَ يَا أُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ Whenever it comes to learning or reading or uh, the Quran or learning Arabic or 
even even learning some very basic fundamentals on Islam, the, the, the first thing that I do is say, everything around me is in Arabic. So I have to learn Arabic first to get there. And then I say, this is my old me by the way, then I would say, okay, well, I have to learn Arabic, but everybody around me speaks English. Then I would keep saying, okay, my job requires me to speak some Arabic because it's a volunteer program with all locals. So I have to learn some Arabic for my job, but they're not funding my Arabic courses or giving me time off to support this. So everybody externally is not allowing me or forcing me or helping me too much along the way. That's the biggest struggle you find when you become a new Muslim. The individuals come and go. Some of them support you a little bit. Everybody says they want to help you, but maybe they aren't the right people to help you in the first place. But I forced myself a bit here and there to learn a lot more and to try to practice actually some classical Arabic, not just the slang that you pick up on the streets with the people and how to communicate, but learning a bit more about the, the original Arabic. Everything has been given to me. I'm very fortunate. I should not have to suffer just because I have to find a little different way of living my life or something I have to learn to, to live my life better. So little by little I've become a little bit stronger and more self-sufficient in terms of this and not depending on so many people to, to help me along the way, which is good and bad because it speaks worlds about what is my perception and my experience of the, the Muslim community, but also about how you have to really answer for yourself on the Day of Judgment and every day of your life. It's not about anybody else, it's about how you answer for yourself. <laughs> she sells seashells by the seashore. Marhaba! <laughs> Marhaba Sa'a! Shaykh Balik Ya Rayal! Alhamdulillah Tamam! Alhamdulillah! And Inta? Wayn Diyarak! I try a little bit, but not good, huh? Aba Akal Machbus wa Samaj. Machbus bil Samaj. Wa Wayd Yuan. Ahyanan Basarid al Salata or Shay Basit, Yani. Al Hain? Aish. Samaj. Dijaj. Sambusa. Aish.